Before I give the call to the Honourable Ben Dawkins, I'll just take this opportunity to remind members of the customs and courtesies uh, for all new members. An, in, in, an inaugural speech is time limited and the timers won't be used. Sorry, it's untimed and the timers won't be used. The speech should be heard in silence and other members should not stand or leave the chamber during the speech. The new member should be heard without interruption or interjection. The new member's inaugural speech should not directly criticise other members or otherwise provoke interjections or points of order. And the rules of relevance are not applied to inaugural speech. Having uh, outlined the customs and courtesies observed during an inaugural speech, I now give the call to the Honourable Ben Dawkins. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me, Madam President. I'm not interested in politics, Madam President. Politics in itself does nothing to help the people. One definition of politics is activities aimed at improving someone's status or increasing power within an organisation. It's pretty obvious that on that definition I'm not interested in politics because I blew the whistle on the corrupt inner workings of the Labor Party, leading me to be expelled with no st status or power in any organisation. <clears throat> I can proudly say that I failed at politics but it su succeeded at Parliament, which suits me fine. It is with exceptional pride that I've taken the parliamentary oath to serve the people of Western Australia. It would have been <clears throat> very hard to serve the people of Western Australia from the Labor Party particularly as a Labor backbencher acting and voting on party lines. Not to mention that the Labor Party rarely seeks to serve the people of Western Australia and mainly serves itself. Note that the, that the definition of politics I refer to does not include anything about serving the people. I'll repeat that definition of politics. Activities aimed at improving one's status or increasing power within, within an organisation. I can't avoid the label of president of president of politician, but I prefer the label of parliamentarian, and I'd love to be a statesman, but but that is a high honour that can only be assessed and bestowed upon you by others. On Monday, Honourable for, former Premier Colin Barnett AC was recognised in the King's Birthday Honours, and I congratulate former Premier Barnett. <clears throat> but what is most interesting, Madam President, was what the West said about him, and also Mr Barnett's interview on ABC Radio. The West described Mr Barnett as one of this country's last statesmen, which I find interesting. A statesman can be defined as someone who does everything for the common good of the people he or she represents, and can be thought of, therefore, as the opposite of a politician. This seems to be something really worth aspiring for, doesn't it? The parliamentary oath to faithfully serve the people and the title of honourable member seems to suggest that statesmanship is what is wanted from us, not political manoeuvring. In his radio interview, Mr Barnett, said that at the beginning of his time as Premier, he made certain commitments to himself that his government would be one of integrity, that is, honest and doing the right thing in accordance with moral principles. This is why an understanding of ethics and even philosophy seems to be more important to me in this role than anything else. It also tells me that an important, it is important to define your principles at the beginning of any role and go forth with those principles. always defining your approach to each issue you encounter, encounter along the way. Surely if you hold true to principles of honesty, frankness, fairness and serving the people, then you can't go too far wrong, can you? I'm very fortunate that I come from the legal profession, which has a set of conduct rules and ethical standards based on honesty, frankness, service and avoiding conflicts of interest. And I understand that those things need to be at the centre of every action we take. I was probably dismissive and even critical of Mr Barnett because being a member of the Labor Party on and off but first joining 34 years ago, I was typically partisan and biased and probably a bit childish in the way that I slavishly dismissed anyone from the other side of politics. But there was something about Mr Barnett that gradually over time began to impress me, an honesty and a directness that was powerful. In regard to Perth Stadium, when there were attempts to scupper the project due to concerns about contamination on the site, Mr Barnett simply said, if there's contamination there, we will dig it up and remove it. I suspect the public are grateful for Mr Barnett being undeterred by the noise and providing a stadium that has now hosted an AFL grand final amongst other great events. In relation to the reduction of dangerous shark numbers after a fatal shark attack 
at Chains Beach in my electorate, Mr Barnett said in relation to his catch and kill policy, I don't do that with any sense of glee. I regret that. But at the same time, my responsibility as Premier is to the public of Western Australia. Brilliant. Note Mr Barnett's commitment to the public of Western Australia, not his own popularity. Contrast this with the current government's analysis paralysis when it comes to dealing with the recent fatal shark attack in the Swan River at North Fremantle. It looks like a kid either caught the offending shark or one very similar the, the following night across the river. And we're not even allowed to take that one shark out of the river. It's well established that governments have a right to control animal populations, both feral and native, if there is a risk to public safety and the native animal species is not endangered. The killer shark species are not endangered and continue to be a threat to public safety. So taking one, particularly one that fits, fits the profile of a recent killer, is perfectly justifiable. Even if it only makes a difference of one, it's a difference, and it could be a difference that saves a child's life. Refusing to take any sharks that meet the profile of a dangerous shark in a swimming area is political correctness gone mad. I would like to cut through political correctness, Madam President, and the woke agenda by being honest and direct, and always working on what helps the lives of electors. That is an aspiration and hard to implement, I know. Perhaps both Mr Barnett and myself are politically incorrect, but sometimes being politically incorrect is the morally correct thing to do. I can prove that I'm politically correct because I'm the only one I think that is sitting here or standing here today in this chamber that has been expelled from a political party, which in itself is proof perhaps. I'm not proud of political incorrectness. It's not something I set out to be. It's just a result of wanting to be direct, honest, truthful, forthright, open and frank. And I don't know that it is possible to serve the people from Western Australia and South West by rigidly sticking to political correctness convention and by applying a political or woke filter to everything I do and say. I've said very little so far until today, but I take the oath to, serve, to faithfully serve the people of Western Australia very seriously, as I do my oath to the court and my undertaking to represent my mainly pro bono, pro bono, pro bono clients in the courts. To me, there is only one way, and that is without fear or favour. Having no fear is powerful. That is why I think I'm a good chance to be one of the first people re-elected to this chamber at the next election in 2025. I am unhindered by the party system, at least for now, and, th and that is the way it should be. Australia needs more independence, like Andrew Wilkie, even like Jackie Lambie. We love Jackie because she reads things thoroughly and then speaks bluntly about whether or not it is good or bad for her beloved people of Tasmania. Jackie is real, very real. Too real for most and therefore unfairly criticised. Jackie is good for democracy. A real person in the parliament, real feelings, real life experience, tragedy, real mistakes and stuff ups, real hardship and real thoughts and real words. Keep it real, Jackie. We love you. I find you very lovable. So a bit behind my principles and my hopes for the future, perhaps. I grew up in Nanup in the southwest. My mum moved there from Perth in 1979 after divorcing my dad, Roger, the professor, medical doctor and immunologist. My mum met Steve, my stepfather. Steve's parents came from Croatia in 1936 into Fremantle and then came then down to Nanup. They were given 240 acres of Jarrah and red gum and told if they could clear it, they could keep it. An early settlement scheme for migrants. Steve was born in 1937 into this environment. A dirt floor, snakes and mice crawling over him. Steve became a farmer and a tree faller in the bush, working in a radius of around 160 k's from Nanup through to near Margaret River, down towards Augusta at Warner Glen, out towards Donnybrook, out towards Manjimup, Greenbushes and Bridgetown. In 85 years, Steve never left his farm in the southwest. Steve's best mate was the late Johnny Tomazzi, a classic southwest Italian. Steve would cut down the trees. Johnny would sneak them in with the loader. They worked all over and were renowned jokers and pranksters. Steve put a live jugite in the cab of a ute belonging to a forestry officer once. Steve hated the government and any authority, always telling him what he could do and what he could do and couldn't do in the bush, which trees could be fallen and which had to stay. <clears throat> Johnny reckons Steve saved his life a few times and vice versa. A better pair of characters in the southwest you could never meet. It was a robust environment to grow up in for me. There was pilfering of all kinds happening down there. We spent half our time chasing kangaroos, foxes, rabbits and even emus. The means of capture were not always correct by today's standards. There was marining out of season, although Steve tells me this was done in the company of the local police sergeant at the time. 
I was everywhere with Steve. I loved him and he loved me. He died last year. He wasted away in a nursing home in East Romantle of, of all places. I tried to get him back to Nanup Hospital, closer to his farm, where he had lived for 84 years. Douglas Valley, he called it. The complaint section at the health department said he was a category four and Nanup Hospital only took category three people. To hell with your categories, I said. Steve hated the government, now you're trying to kill him. He will, he will die in Perth in a nursing home. He was born on the farm and, and thrives in the bush. I rang Roger Cook's office. I tried everything, including offering to build a mini hospital on, on the farm, but nothing worked. Steve went downhill in the city, like the last Tasmanian tiger in captivity on that grainy video, pacing around the enclosure, pining for home and freedom. Captivity was what killed him. Steve said, Norm, he used to, <clears throat> he used to call me Norm, it would be good. <laughs> It will be good if you get into that parliament, son. You can help me out and get me back to the farm, son. I, I said to Steve, I didn't get in. I was number five on the ticket, Steve. Only the first three went in, Steve. You'll get this, son, he said, and I quote, if I can, give him shit when you do. <clears throat> I'm proud to be here, Steve, but it's too late. Steve died last year. We lost a unique character known across the southwest. My mother effectively <coughs> joined the hippie commune in Nanup, meanwhile, so Steve and Mum were an odd couple. Mum probably only stayed a couple of nights in the actual commune, but frequently visited the hippies and was mates with them all. Mum was, <laughs> Mum was generally happy that I was chasing kangaroos with Steve. She didn't have to worry about me then. She was a bit worried when looking for someone, something to eat in the pantry, I came across a large Milo tin of <laughs> green leafy stuff. My honourable colleagues to my right would, would have been delighted. Mum said she was looking after the stash for a hippie friend and I believed her. Mum was actually too fond of the civilised world to be a real hippie. The lack of sanitation and eventually disease like hepatitis that went through the hippie commune in Nanup actually put a few people like Mum off and she quickly returned to relative civilisation with us, us three kids and Steve. I chopped and split a lot of Jarrah rounds in my youth, a huge amount. I had to fill the woodshed all the time and Steve was a hard taskmaster, one of the hardest. I got his belt around my bottom, say, regularly, say every three months. Sometimes he would slap me with an open hand, not to the face or anything and no bruising, but really just a wake up call. I was a dreamy, studious kid and the slaps generally did me good in my opinion. Any kind of verbal put downs really hurt me, but the slaps were directed to making me work harder, chop more wood, be kinder to my mother and other things which were all valid behaviours worth reinforcing with a slap. In my experience, it did me no harm and a fair bit of good. When I was out at the wood heap, I used to listen to ABC radio, Bob Hawke and tre Treasurer Paul Keating, and dream about being in Canberra. <clears throat> my uncle John, Joe Dawkins, was in Canberra at the time, Minister for Education and later Treasurer. I was obsessed with high office, the pride that would come with serving the people, the potential to lift the country out of recession as it was at the time, the honour of public service. I was hooked on the idea. So like my Uncle John, I took off to UWA, studied economics and much later HR at U ECU and law at Murdoch. But I was going to Canberra, that was for sure. There was no other conceivable destination for me. It didn't happen. I did spend a lot of a lot of time, some of it wasted working for finance companies, mining companies and law firms. I also wasted a lot of time attending Labor Party meetings. Not totally wasted, <clears throat> because I got here eventually on the back of a Labor ticket, and I'm grateful. <clears throat> and I'm grateful for that. But I found the party system totally confusing. I wanted to be involved, get on the road to Canberra, do something. Yet we were always talking about campaigning for some union-backed candidate and promoting the Labor brand based on very little, little substance from what I could see. Rather than getting to serve the people, I seemed to be further away than ever. I learned over time that these weren't meetings as such, not places where you could speak freely, but actually sleeper cells for factional war games. The candidates were selected years in advance by the factional overlords in the unions, and unless you were the second coming of Christ, you, couldn't, you wouldn't get pre-selected ahead of the union and factional favourites, hacks and time servers. Even Jesus being a carpenter back in Jerusalem probably wouldn't have had the numbers. The, <clears throat> the carpenters union weren't the dominant faction back then, in the year three or four B BC. 
Nonetheless, I'm proud to be here. I also want to provide some focus out there for people that are struggling, Madam President. <clears throat> I don't want to dwell on or be defined by mental illness, but I'm sharing, probably oversharing, so that even one person can feel empowered to keep working towards their goals, no matter how bad they are. People at their lowest ebb. I want to say I know from experience that you can be happy again. The Marion Centre, Perth Clinic, Hollywood, and on the public side, Alma Street and Fremantle, and Bentley Hospital, for example, there are silent sufferers out there, forgotten by the mainstream. I know that you feel like giving up. I know that mental illness can be totally debilitating. I was an inpatient at Marion Centre in 2016 to 2018, about four times, for up to three weeks at a time. <clears throat> I was an inpatient, sorry, I said that. I was one of the worst, no treatment would help. I didn't have electroconvulsive therapy, although that was recommended, but I had just about everything else, pharmacologically and counselling-wise, you can have. I went backwards for a while, catatonically depressed and anxious. I got there through negative thinking, beating myself up, feeling inadequate, inadequate professionally. I was working all hours of the night suing banks, government departments and mining companies on behalf of the little guy. I loved the work. I loved being what I call a public interest lawyer. But, but I was paid peanuts and the clients had no money. The defendants had all the money and all the big law firms working for them. So I didn't feel valued. I thought I was a loser compared to my mates who had big jobs working for the same banks, government departments and mining companies. I drove myself into a huge hole, hating myself. My only suggestion to others with the debilitating illness like this is to stay, take a step towards your goals. Preferably, but not always, this is a step forward. But any step will do. It might be like me, forcing yourself or myself out of bed and walking around the block just once. One of the steps I took getting back from the brink was deciding to stop working for my father with whom I had begun working at the, for at the time, and to be independent and self-governing again. But another step a bit later was in 2020 when I applied to run for the region of South West in this chamber. The WA Labor State Secretary at the time was very supportive of my past mental illness and encouraged me to nominate for South West, and I even tried to get the fourth spot on the ticket but lost to Mr Mondy, John Mondy at the administrative committee stage, six votes to seven. For me, a big part of getting out of a hole was allowing myself to dream again about serving the people. My inspiration for sharing my pathway back to recovery from mental illness comes from His Honour Mark Ritter, recently appointed <coughs> to the district court, to the bench at the district court, who said the following about law firms and mental illness upon his appointment, and I quote, examples of bullying, sexual harassment, unreasonable work hours and expectations from or condoned in one way or another by partners and principals are matters of great concern to the profession and something should be done about it. I think that the way to move some of these issues forward might be, a collective, might be collective bargaining for working conditions, maybe even a union to involve in work practices that are not up to standard. In my case, the pathway and getting <coughs> here has only been with the assistance of people that have helped, my, per, helped me with my personal anxiety, self-esteem issues, and shortcomings as a person to help me make it here. I will not name them, of course, those people in the medical and broader professions, but I do thank them. Like his honour, I will also thank my helpers in the medical profession, particularly my psychiatrist at the Marion Centre, a more genuine, encouraging bloke you would never find. My psychiatrist said, up, said that up to 2007, and I quote, <clears throat> I was plagued by a very obsessional personality framework and a deeply held fear of making mistakes, letting others down, doing the wrong thing. This set of vulnerabilities likely originates from a childhood picture of pleomorphic anxiety, OCD, and a subjectively um, punitive parent, parental figure in brackets father, with a deeply seated sense in Mr Dawkins of failing to meet the perceived expectations of others. I've been particularly well and happy since 2018, Madam President, and aside from some relationship issues and some more brutal treatment from principals of law firms that has caused temporary lapses into anxiety and sadness, I'm fully recovered. I use the word mental illness to describe my historical suffering because we should be direct and honest. Everyone has varying degrees of mental health, but it is mental illness that is the hardest to recover from and needs the most urgent treatment. In any case, I campaigned, door knocked and phone banked in Fremantle and volunteered on election day in Bunbury, 
and I was a candidate in the 2021 election. I received a letter of recognition and thanks from Premier Mark McGowan, saying that I had performed a vital role, vital and important role, in the re-election of the McGowan government and performed my role as a candidate with distinction. You can imagine my disappointment when I received no response to my calls and emails to Mr McGowan to discuss my situation leading up to the recount earlier this year. I do acknowledge the very good people that are the Honourable Alana McTiernan and Mr John Mondy and their decisions ultimately opened up the opportunity for me, but there was no accident. I was pre-selected, entrenched on the ticket and the process governed by the Electoral Commission played out. I was even more horrified when Mr McGowan said to the West that I was elected by accident. It was a dis dishonest and hurtful thing for him to say. I'm certain that no one has been elected by accident to this chamber, Madam President, um, by the Electoral Commission process. It's a very well-defined and regulated process. It's also a democratic right to initiate court proceedings against those that have done wrong. I was staggered to see Mr McGowan publicly state that me suing WA Labor over the corrupt manipulation of the pre-selection for Forest was one of the reasons that I was to be expelled. Taking legal action was the best thing I'd ever done. Our kids need to know that you must stand up for yourself. Democracy only works when citizens participate in it, in it and exercise their democratic rights. Mr McGowan's understanding of legal principles and ethics seemed to have waned since his study of the law, or perhaps Mr McGowan deliberately abandoned those principles to obtain and exercise power unilaterally. In most organisations which have, are, are regulated, there is a prohibition on taking retribution against those who have blown the whistle. But alas, as I'll come to later, political parties are beyond the law in Australia. I saw none of the integrity that Mr Barnett, is, I think, is now famous for. It is worth reflecting on contrasting styles of leadership and that sometimes organisations promote leaders because they are bold and decisive, which is attractive. But equally, those leaders can lack empathy for others or even publicly ridicule them. Power is what they crave, and they have little regard for the effect that their actions have on others. I have great, grave concerns about the, major, the morality of mandating an unproven vaccine, coercing people with the threat of losing their jobs into receiving a vaccine that in some instances is causing adverse events. Unless something was proven to be safe or even 99.9% .9 safe, you couldn't in all good faith mandate it, could you? You couldn't coerce people to take it, could you? That would be a step too far, surely. Encourage, but mandate and coerce? No. I have empathy for those that exercise their fundamental individual freedom to choose what medical treatment is injected into their body and therefore lost their jobs, and for those that were coerced into receiving Mr McGowan's vaccine and now regret it, and particularly those young people like my nephew who are suffering adverse effects of the unproven vaccine. Mr McGowan saw a high rate of vaccine as a way to improving popularity. His motivations were to obtain more popularity and power. I have similar concerns as to how, some, how one could use their power to remove the regional representation in this House. Use their power to guarantee more power? That sounds power hungry. It should concern all of us that Mr McGowan rushed through an act of parliament to quash an existing legal right held by Mr Clive Palmer. His motivation was that he didn't like Mr Palmer. Where does that kind of breach of legal principle end? If the Premier doesn't like your mum, dad, spouse, daughter or son, then he retrospectively removes their legal rights too? In planning, I hold similar concerns about the removal of elected councils from the planning approvals process, given Mr McGowan's proximity to pro property developers and his willingness to chase and receive their donations. That decision also looks a bit murky. Democracy and civil liberties are be being destroyed in WA, and in any way I can, I dedicate this term to restoring them. I say it is also the party system, Madam President, that is killing democracy, absolutely stuffing up democracy and accountability completely. The Labor Party is killing democracy in this state. I, I stand here today hoping to represent the people in the regions, the South West, but also add into the wheat belt where I've worked. Can anyone think of a better region in the world to represent than Mandra to Albany? A better place in the world? If you asked me to represent the South of France, I'd say get lost. Margaret River, Dunsborough, Busso, Bridgetown, where I used to play footy, Hamlin Bay, where I go salmon fishing every year, Nanup, where I grew up, Denmark and Albany, effectively the original capital of this state and from where the Anzacs left to sail to Gallipoli. I stand 
here today, having stood as a Labor candidate for South West, campaigned in Perth and Bunbury in 2021, only to find that when I get here two years later, that Labor has destroyed the representation from the regions. Have political parties done this? Yes. I look at, to my left, uh, he's not here. Um, I was referring to the Honourable Darren West, a real farmer, and I was going to ask um, the Honourable Darren West, did he vote in favour of abolishing specific regional representation in this House, uh, Honourable Member? <clears throat> I, I read your speech supporting the abolishment of the regions. I find it hard to believe that your constituents at the time would have wanted no regions, but not your fault. You have to vote as a block in Labor, don't you? No. It seems to me that you were forced to vote for your party and not your people. Honourable Member, this encapsulates the problem with political parties, particularly Labor and the Labor majority in this state. Democracy is being destroyed in the sense that the elected representatives don't act and vote in favour of the people. Even worse, they vote in favour of further destroying democracy by removing democratic representative mechanisms such as regions in this chamber which have traditionally given people in the country a say. It's a compounding problem. The parties are the blockage that breaks the link between what the electors want and what happens in this House. Democracy dies when this happens. And what was the motivation for this change? Labor, the dominant force here in WA already, wanted to become more dominant by effectively legislating their way to a guaranteed majority in this chamber forever into the future. Labor and the unions are essentially creatures of the metro area. Yes, they have members in the bush, but here in the city they have a campaign workforce of union members and other inner city volunteers who volunteer in their thousands in the hope of being recognised by their overlords as loyal apparatchiks who will campaign on any basis to win government. This happens in the city, not so much in the country. Labor will dominate the city vote as a result. The opposition parties don't have this army of volunteers. In a council without regions, the campaigning will be done in the city, <clears throat> where the candidates think the, the majority of easy votes are to be won. By extension, only city issues will be championed. Candidates are unlikely to be campaigning in the bush. They will need $1,000 of diesel, a packed lunch and a water bag to drive to remote communities in the hope of getting a single vote. Where is the return in that? There is no longer an incentive to campaign in or indeed serve the bush. Rewards drive behaviour. It's human nature, so nearly all candidates will focus on capturing the city vote, the low-hanging fruit. The city vote is also largely a Labor vote, so the Labor Party has stitched up the people of this state quite nicely, haven't they? As I said, I haven't spoken much in this place, but I have spoken about the Glen Iris Golf Course in Janicott. The Labor Party has served itself, but not the people. If I'm one of the first people to be re-elected re in, in this building, as I hope to be, I'm told from Lee, by Leanne of the residence group in Glen Iris that the member of Janicott will be one of the first to lose his seat. The reason he is representing the party, not the people. In three years, he has refused to do anything to help Leanne and the others. He says he can't. It's true. If he speaks to the residents and supports them, he will have to go against what he's been told to do by the, his overlords in the government. His overlords have met with the developers, accepted $27,500 in political donations from them, and approved the development, despite the elected council overwhelmingly rejecting it nine votes to one. Disgustingly, 10,000 signatures to this chamber in a petition opposing the resigning were ignored. The member for Janicott has now apparently blocked the residents from his social media. In what way does that amount to delivering on the oath to serve the people of Western Australia in this building? Keep quiet, support the party, not the people. That is the opposite of effective democracy. I will try and change that here. I could never do that as a Labor backbencher. And I'm very pleased not to be a lame duck Labor backbencher, prohibited from speaking for the people, prohibited from voting in accordance with the elector's wishes and instead voting on party lines. I also want to say something about the word corruption. My first question to this House was shouted down because I used the word corruption. The Triple C website says corruption includes deliberately failing to perform the functions of office properly. I'm not going to attribute that to any individual, but I think it's time we all grew up and became a, a, a bit less, less precious. Standards of accountability in, uh, of parliamentarians needs to lift. Failing to listen and act up to the voices of the electorate should be grounds for removal from office. I've never imputed or implied that there are brown paper bags changing hands, 
but there is dereliction of duty going on. Corruption in the Morris modern sense covers all forms of improper use of office and deliberate failures to perform the role properly. It is, if it is to be tackled, we need to talk about it and understanding it. Shutting down any talk of possible corruption, because it might be an uncomfortable discussion to have, would be cor corruption in itself. Democracy has failed to adapt to the modern world. It's a perfect storm, driving governments and political parties into the realm of minority interest, populism, sensationalism, political posturing, creative accounting, information control, disinformation, <coughs> misinformation and media management. I talk about something today that is critical to advancing and protecting our democracy, exposing <coughs> the secret operations of the institution known as a political party and reforming this ghastly institution. There are dozens of examples in recent years where political parties or their office bearers have faced allegations relating to their conduct. This includes branch stacking, bullying, intimidation, defamation and discrimination. This is often in the context of pre-selections that are undemocratically manipulated by the factions and unions, intent on removing the, the right of branch members to cast a local vote. It also extends to other conduct, including wrongful expulsions without affording natural justice and manipulating the rules of the political party to suit their needs at the time. In fact, the rules of the political party and democracy, democracy as a whole uh, appear to be largely ignored. It may interest members to know that democracy as we know it was first created by accident. For decades after the first Reform Act of 1832 in the United Kingdom, the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party debated how and to what extent they would further expand the franchise or pool of voters to include the working man. Each side would, would only support such a measure if they believed it benefited them. Call it luck, a fluke or divine intervention, in 1867, William Gladstone, leader of the Liberals, and ben Benjamin Disra Disraeli, leader of the Conservatives, finally agreed to further reforms that would double the franchise from approximately one million to two million voters. Both believed the reforms would benefit them. It created a need to attract volunteers so that the political parties could communicate with the masses. However, unsurprisingly, the party elites, whether deliberately, sociologically or a bit of both, were not prepared to surrender their power. They needed a way to attract volunteers but keep those volunteers away from the party decision making. It took 35 years before the Russian political scientist Mosey Ost Ostrogolsky first analysed the inner wor workings of this new version of a political party. Nine years later, an Italian sociologist by the name of Robert Michels expanded on Ostrogorsky's work. What they argued was that modern political parties are not and never intended to be engage with the members as the community believed and continues to believe today. The structure of the so-called modern political party was created to preserve the power of the elites or wire pullers, as Ostrogorsky puts it. In fact, Michels described it as inevitable that political parties would become oligarchies concentrating power in the hands of few people rather than the members. The honest truth is that political parties are not democratic and arguably never have been, despite claiming to be so. They do not afford local members direct and exclusive say over pre-selections and other decision-making. Power is centralised in the hands of a select few individuals, many of them outside the elected members of the parliament. These individuals have been called many, many things. Factional leaders, factional warlords, power brokers, faceless men and wire pullers. The political parties control the selection of candidates for parliament and therefore who is ultimately elected to parliament and exert influence, significant influence over the policy decisions of governments and also receive substantial sums of public money, Madam President. 74 million in the last federal election, 27 million to Labor, 26 and a half million to Liberal in the last federal election to run the federal elections effectively. They perform, <clears throat> or run in, they perform public functions and therefore are in substance and practice a public institution. How can they be given public money, yet they aren't even regu regulated? They aren't even required to incorporate, Madam President. Within decades after 1867, power transitioned away from the parliamentary leaders to the so-called unelected wire pullers inside the political parties. This continues today. They sit in the shadows, away from public scrutiny, <clears throat> influencing, if not controlling, the decisions of government. In w <clears throat> by controlling the inner workings of the party. With the Labor government in WA, these people are the union leaders, the left faction unions, mainly Carolyn Smith and the United Workers Union. They control pre-selection, policy, rule changes, 
an exercise of all power inside the party. They care not for the party's rules. They exercise their power at will. They care for, they care not for democracy or the people. They care only about power. Mark McGowan was not aligned with the union and that saved us and the budget to a degree. If history repeats, then it's, it's likely that Roger Cook this week will embark on a series of transactions to pay back the United Workers' Union and the AMWU for installing him as Premier. We will pay for that. There will likely be a raft of higher than necessary inflationary pay increases. Not because we asked for it, That's but close. because Mr Cook owes a debt to those who order, have the real power. Order member. The order member. I've been listening really quite carefully to um, your contribution and I'd just like to, at this stage, draw your attention to the general rules of debate in the House, which also apply in an inaugural speech, and particularly to Standing Orders 44 and 45. In this regard, and in this any debate, including your inaugural speech, um, words that are offensive or make personal reflections on members of parliament in this House or the other House are highly disorderly uh, and could be determined as unparliamentary. If there are matters which you wish to erase, which you feel uh, so aggrieved about, um, you may have the opportunity to debate those at other times. However, in the context of your inaugural speech, I will remind you again that personal reflections on members of parliament in both houses may be considered disorderly. Please continue. I was going to say, Madam President, um, that I hope I'm wrong about that, um, about those pay increases. I just wanted to say that the people <clears throat> are not fully aware of the conflicts of interest in this state, but need to be told. Sunlight is the best medicine. Let's be transparent. Let's be tra transparent about uh, to whom, shall I say, uh, we owe our office. Shall I say? Another possible source of influence over the decisions of political parties relates to political donations. There is at least a perception that money buys influence. That is, political parties are subject to the interests of those who fund them. There is another issue for reform. In this state, with the massive infill housing program, we must, as I've alluded to, ban for transparency political donations by property developers in this term of government. Many people, including in parliament, are too naive to see, too self-centred to care, or too scared to speak out about things. As a result, a cancer to democracy is left unchecked, forever eating away at what democracy should be. This needs to change. <clears throat> Our citizens are entitled to know the truth, the whole truth, about how political parties operate, who is really making decisions and why they are making those decisions. They have a right to know how the decisions of their representatives and the day-to-day -day agenda of our governments are being controlled by external forces. The rule of law does not apply to political parties. They can bully, blackmail, defame, discriminate and intimidate their members and candidates and apparently cannot be held accountable for it. They can arbitrarily expel people and exclude people from pre-selection or nominating for other positions. They can rig votes in internal elections, deny members any say, and it's all okay. This can impact people's lives, personally, financially, psychologically, professionally, and reputationally. But parties have impunity. They are not bound by anti-discrimination laws. Their office bearers are not bound by professions or professional or ethical duties. They are not required to actually be democratic. They can also do all these things, yet receive tens of millions of dollars from the public purse. Most political parties and their office bearers are, for all intents and purposes, above the law. In my journey, I heard about factions and factional deals, but I thought nothing of it. Few people would open up about it. I attended branch meetings, but did not enjoy it much. It was not until I sought pre-selection in the federal seat of Forest that I soon experienced firsthand what it was all about. Steve McCartney, the State Secretary of the AMWU, told me that a deal had already been done. The seat of Forest was already allocated to the left faction and his union, Steve and Carolyn, would decide. 
I applied. I believed that my application would be considered on its merits. However, it wasn't. The administrative committee simply rejected my application or expression of interest, I should, should say, because it, I wasn't a, me a member of the correct union or any union. I had already been praised by Mr Gow McGowan for my work in the state campaign and for performing my candidacy in the state election with distinction. No truthful reasons were ever given for me being eliminated before my credentials were, were even considered. There was no merit selection process. The process was a sham. In 2013, the WA Labor Party had changed its rules to create a two-stage process for pre-selection in which members would first have to submit an expression of interest to, to the administrative committee. This was the process that I was in. This was hailed by the WA Labor Party, including Mark McGowan at the time, as a movement towards democracy and greatest local say in pre-selection. The administrative committee of WA Labor used its newfound power to execute applicants they did not want and allow candidates that align with predetermined factional union deals to progress. This is less democratic. The reasons for the changes to the rules in 2013 were a lie. Instead of the wire pullers controlling the vote, they now control who goes through to a local vote. There hasn't been, any, been a democ democratic vote of branch members in WA Labor since 2012 in the federal seat of Tagney, for pre-selection that is. The people's power has been deliberately cut out of the system. In 2021, Ben Harris, convener of the right faction in Labor, sent an email to factional members about pre-selection for the federal seat of Swan. I tabled this email to the House. Order, member. Uh, in order to table any documents, you need to seek the leave of the House. Oh. So I seek the leave of the House to table, to table. this document. Is leave granted? Oh. Leave is granted. Thank you, um, Madam President. So I didn't hear. They <clears throat> Just one yeah. moment, honourable member. Uh, leave, um, there may have been dissent in um, leave being granted, so I'm going to put the question again. Is leave granted for the document to be tabled? No. There, there have been an indication that leave is not granted, therefore the document is not tabled. That's fine, Your Honour. I'll Please just continue your remarks. In case. Um, <clears throat> ben Harris, the convener of the right faction in the Labor Party, sent an email to faction members about pre-selection for the federal seat of Swan. In the email, he states, amongst other things, on Friday, members of the broad left use their majority on the administrative committee to eliminate a candidate for pre-selection on factional grounds and circumvent the party's democratic processes for pre-selecting candidates. Those who voted against our, our motion ultimately voted to deprive every rank and file member in Swan of the, an opportunity to choose their preferred candidate. However, the actions of the broad left to deny local ele electors any say in the pre-selection process is shameful. Swan is an important seat in the up upcoming ele election and disenfranchising, I like that, Disenfranchising local members of the party does nothing to help us win it back. What does it say when a person of Fiona's calibre is told that the Labor Party won't even allow her to nominate for pre-selection? This is an issue not just in Swan, but for any pre pre future pre-selection in WA if this decision stands. What is to stop those on admin who voted to circumvent the party rules from doing it again? This is, this is emails about Fiona Reid, who was arbitrarily eliminated by the left faction who have a majority of votes on the administrative committee because the left faction preferred their left candidate. The left candidate went on to win the, a seat in the federal parliament, which means Fiona may have been un, unethically and immorally done out of a job in Canberra. I, can, I say unethically rather than unlawfully because whilst the party rules should have the status of law under contract and administrative law, due to a quirk in our common law, they do not. When Mr Harris says, <coughs> what is to stop those on admin who voted to circumvent the party rules from doing it again? The answer is nothing. Such gross abuses of power have been occurring ever since the rules were changed in 2013 with support from both the left and the right factions. Christian Cockman, in his book, Keeping One Eye Open, What the Parties Aren't Telling You. Um, can I apply for leave to submit a chapter of a book? A uh, table? Member, the form of words is that you seek leave to table. Seek the leave to table. Um, may I? 
Uh, Madam President. The Honourable Member seeks leave to table the document. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. What the parties aren't telling that you. That document is tabled. Is the name of the book. Tells us that he was the only nominee when pre selection for Cowan opened in 2015, having done a great job obtaining a swing in the previous federal election. In an effort to ensure Mr Cockerman did not become the WA Labor candidate for Cowan, the WA Labor Party, including now federal MP Mr Patrick Gorman, appears to have conjured up two very doubtful expressions of interest out of time to justify reopening of the expression of interest and nominations process. These expressions of interest were allegedly from someone who recently worked for Mark McGowan and, for a, and a female person working in the media. The credibility and authenticity of the two apparent expressions of interest must be questioned in circumstances where neither of these individuals became WA Labor Party candidates and there, there was no vote for pre-selection by local members or otherwise. The subsequent resolution by State Executive to extend the expression of interest and nominations process then changed to allow anyone to submit an expression of interest and nominate rather than those two specific individuals. This is shown by minutes and I, I seek leave, Madam President, to table these minutes. The Honourable Member seeks leave to table the document. Is leave granted? No. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Was that a yes or a no? The Honourable Member seeks leave to table the document. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. That document is tabled. There are many unanswered questions. Did the expressions of interest which, was, which were suddenly referred to exist? If so, who created and signed them? Were they legitimate? Or was this an elaborate ruse? An intention to trick the party state executive and Mr Cockman while concealing some hidden agenda or purpose? Similar things are happening at most pre-selections within political parties, yet our citizens don't know it. Executive committees and party officials are manipulating and abusing process to ensure that individuals aligned with their interest in ideology are being pre-selected. The process is a sham. WA Labor is not a democracy, it is a dictatorship. The shameful reality is that the wire pullers and, and unions control everything from the membership of the party and pre-selection to ministerial appointments and beyond. Political parties and their office bearers are virtually completely unregulated, a law unto themselves, all powerful, unaccountable and untouchable. The only so solution is incorporation, <coughs> Madam President, and regulation. There should be a standard set of rules that all political parties must follow. These rules should should enforce a separation of powers between the executive committee, the members, the disputes tribunal, enshrine democracy, the rule of law and natural justice, promote equality, transparency and accountability, provide its members with due process. That would be good. C complete, create independent disputes tribunals, impose duties on office bearers and measures to avoid conflicts of interest and most important of all, prevent conflicts with a member of parliament's parliamentary duties. What common law currently applies to political parties? Since 1934, there have been several dozen cases involving political parties, including at least 10 over the last five years. This is in addition to dozens of legal cases involving voluntary associations, associations to which the same common law applies. You're probably familiar, Madam President, it begins with the rather perplexing High Court decision from 1934 of Cameron and Hogan. We need to remember this one which characterises political parties and other voluntary unincorporated associations of purely domestic concern, I don't know, not justifying intervention by the courts. The, the court said that such cases were not justiciable, requiring all parties to incorporate would fix this. In 1974, the case of McKinnon, a, a case involving a rugby league club, highlighted the importance of voluntary associations and the importance of protecting the rights of individuals. For decades after, Supreme Court's found ways to distinguish the, the decision in Cameron and Hogan in order to allow aggrieved members to bring disputes. This included an abhorrent case of, of Carter versus New South Wales Netball Association, where a group of members created a fraudulent pe petition to falsely accuse a fellow member of child abuse. This resulted in that member losing her job, her external job, and suffering a mental illness. Strangely, the 2022 Kamenzuli case, which occurred shortly before the 2022 federal election, it actually delayed the last federal election, if you recall, upheld the decision in, Cam in Cameron and Hogan. The Kamenzuli decision has re reignited a conflict over how the rules of voluntary associations are to be treated at common law, 
It has also caused a conflict with the Victorian decision of ASMA, which found certain disputes involving political parties justiciable under the Victorian Electoral Act. At common law, only the High Court can resolve these conflicts. In the decisions of Cameron and Camanzulli are to be upheld if people like the plaintiff in the, in the case of Carter would be denied natural justice. Political parties and their office bearers continue to rely on the decisions in Cameron and Camanzulli. When a voluntary association incorporates under state legislation, it becomes subject to some standards specified in those acts. In particular, the association is normally required to adopt model rules. These model rules typically enshrine democracy inside the association, for example, mandating that office bearers are to be elected directly by the members. However, as of 15th of March 2023, it appears that the, Aust the Australian Electoral Commission, only four out of 57 registered political parties are incorporated. In any event, the state legislation does not pres prescribe a de democratic process for pre-selection, a, a process unique to political parties. Therefore, political parties that are incorporated can, can still avoid the model rules. The increasing frequency of legal cases involving political parties highlights the current laws are out of date with community expectations. Any person joining a political party has a right to expect that the rules would be binding against the political party and its office bearers as much as the rules are binding on each member. They would also be, have a right to expect that the political parties and its office bearers would follow the principles of natural justice and other administrative law principles or proper decision making. Opening up pre-selection will attract new members to political parties which, and ultimately more capable and diverse candidates. It will also take away jobs for the boys, which characterises and determines most pre-selections. If governments consider that it is a public, in the public interest to regulate the affairs of a local sporting club, it is self-evident that it would be in the public interest to regulate the affairs of political parties. Current laws, including the Commonwealth Electoral Act, are inadequate to prevent the types of improper conduct discussed above. This House should consider regulating political parties in WA in much the same way as incorporated associations. Some aspects of the regulation may be similar to that which applies to incorporated associations generally. However, other aspects of regulation may be different to the unique, due to the unique functions of political parties. It's a sad state of affairs to know that your bowling club is more regulated and accountable than a political party. And it's an indictment on this institution in which we sit today to which we claim we owe our allegiance to allow unelected wire pullers and unionists inside political parties to dictate and influence outcomes or lack of outcomes for the citizens of Western Australia. The first step to finding a solution starts with acknowledging and talking about the problem. I hope that by etching these issues into Hansard for the rest of time, someone at some point now or in the future will join the fight to save democracy from the hands of the wire, wire pullers that hide within the modern political party. I will bring a private member's bill that requires political parties to incorporate in WA. This in itself will overcome the archaic 1932 authority in Cameron and Hogan and open the way to making political parties justiciable, democratic and accountable. Madam President, I will finish with what I call some elevator pitches on, which, on what appears to be necessary and immediate changes needed in this state. I don't have the means to change these things, but I've started the process of researching them and making attempts to progress them with others in this building. Iron ore royalties. The return to the state and the people on iron ore royalties has not kept pace with a massive increase in export revenues from iron ore. The people own the minerals. The people deserve a bigger share. The McGowan government hasn't acted on this, or didn't act on this, and Mr McGowan's friendliness to the mining industry may explain in part why this has not been rectified. It will be of interest to the, for, to the people whether former Treasurer McGowan also ends up on the board of a mining company in this state in addition to his taxpayer-funded pension, especially given that that was the path taken by the previous Treasurer of our state. An improvement in the return on iron ore royalties could be channelled into very worthy areas such as healthcare. Just quickly, Your Honour, um, not Your Honour, um, Madam President, um, housing good. affordability for under, 30, under 30s, superannuation first, super first home super saving scheme. Madam President, there are no members, either in this place or the other place, under 30. Nobody is doing anything for under 30s. Is there any reason why we can't give from the surplus or from an improved, from improved iron ore royalties? Every person under 30 who pays tax on 30 June this year with a res residential in this address in WA 
$1,000 into the federal government's first home super saver scheme. It sounds to me like a no-brainer. One, <coughs> our young people are locked out of the housing market and need something like $60,000 for a deposit on a home. Housing is the biggest issue for our young people and the generations of people in this state who have, been, have benefited from many housing and mining booms would not begrudge their kids or grandkids getting a gift from the state government, would they? This would require some, of, some cooperation from the ATO, but the amount would actually go into the young person's superannuation account. And if eligible for the scheme, the person would use it and up to a limit of $50,000 of their super towards a home deposit. This scheme's already in place, uh, Madam President. Uh, if the young person wasn't eligible for the scheme, the contribution would just form part of their retirement savings. Using the superannuation scheme for this would be a non-inflationary way of spending some of the government's massive surplus. We must also drop the voting age to 16. The people of, of this age have a lot more invested in the future than us oldies. They are more empathetic, more socially minded, more environmentally minded. If they can pay tax, they can vote, surely. A change like this is needed because in this place we continually refuse to address youth issues. Lowering, lowering the voting age will shake things up nicely and refocus our attention to, to these things. I will be reaching out to Emma Hyink from Margaret River in my electorate. Emma heads up the Make It 16 campaign nationally. I will do whatever I can for Emma. Police training and development. The shortage of police officers seems to be largely due to no, nobody respecting police work as a career, not even the police. Would a way of addressing this not to be to incentivise current and future university students to take at least some policing units in addition to their other units of study? ECU has a policing degree and I'm sure that the other universities could add at least a few policing, investigation and justice units to their offering. By doing so, you could attract graduates who may ha have problems obtaining employment upon graduation to actually consider policing as a long-term career. The, in this, the incentive could be that as a graduate in the police force, in addition to undertaking the physical and operational training, the graduate could be paid more than the normal rookie who doesn't complete the policing units at university. I suspect the that by attracting quality graduates, the additional pay would be more than offset by improved productivity. The West Australian Industrial Relations Commission, where I've appeared many times, other than providing jobs for ex-unionists in a union-friendly environment, ma Madam President, I see no reason why we would keep the WAIRC. We should refer our powers to legislate on industrial relations to the Commonwealth. Why are we the only state not to do so? The Fair Work Act should regulate the employment of all Australians. It is a much more modern act, and in any case, actually provides more protections, such as the general protections to voluntary workers in any case. The voice. It is under-democratic under to usurp the integrity of the federal parliament by giving one group, albeit a very important group, a special influence with the parliament. I stand in support of Indigenous leaders Warren Mundine and Jacinta Nambajira Price on this. The most sacred institution in our democracy is the federal parliament. The mechanism for Indigenous representation is already there. We have 11 Indigenous members in the federal parliament. What we need to address reconciliation is a treaty, not a committee which undermines the integrity of our parliament. Having a voice to parliament will compromise treaty negotiations. The Parliament already has the power to make a treaty. The voice will mean that treaty negotiations will be compromised because one interest group will have a seat at both sides of the negotiation. There will be a specific in Indigenous group on one side of the negotiation and another specific in Indigenous group called the voice on the Parliament side of the negotiation. To a degree, the Indigenous negotiators will be negotiating with themselves leading to a treaty that is more complicated, expensive and divisive than it should be. I know people that are petrified that The Voice is actually a Trojan horse for a form of treaty that will be catastrophic for the finances of this country and catastrophic for productivity. The parliament should have unfettered independence to negotiate a treaty with Aboriginal groups on behalf of all Australians, but instead it will be compromised by The Voice telling it what a treaty has to be. The Voice is ill-conceived, undemocratic, dangerous and the wrong mechanism for reconciliation. I hope that the people of Western Australia can see that the Albanese uh, and even the Cook government are not being transparent about the damage the voice will do, and I hope everyone will vote against it. 
Madam Speaker, as I said, I will use my time in this parliament to do what I can to improve democracy in this state. I thank you for your kindness, and I also thank my father. Even if my father's standards were high, I thank my father for showing me the world and letting me know that we should always strive for high standards, and I also thank him for helping me with my legal costs when I get into trouble. Usually I get into trouble for what starts out as me standing up for myself and others because I think it's the right thing, because I think it's right to do so, but Dad was always there for me. I also, also thank Steve for adopting me as a son and sh showing me how to, li to love, joke with and nurture my son. I'm worried, Madam President, what about what I can achieve given the huge majority that Mr McGowan has built by politicising COVID and scaring people into voting for him. I know this happened because I made campaign calls myself to electors linking COVID and staying safe to his re-election. I apologise to those electors for using those tactics. It's likely that my grand plans will be hard to implement, but I would like to ask my new friends on the crossbench and in the opposition to help me with my proposals. I will help you guys too. We must try to improve what we can in spite of our minority status. Equally important is the groundwork, meeting with electors in the southwest, Bunbury and beyond. If I can help one person to be heard and to feel better about our democracy, that is a start. It is my pleasure to serve, Madam President. I will keep trying. Members, we, we 